Jesus, tell us just briefly what you do uh, professionally. What I do professionally is to teach interpreting. Oh. Uh, mostly simultaneous interpreting, okay. mostly from English into Spanish. And apart from that, well, I, I do some research as well in the field of, uh, of interpreting and I, I could call it intercultural communication as well. I, we have a group, a research group called Alpha Keke. It is the name of, a, of a, the person who in the Middle Ages uh, went to rescue the captives of the enemy and who had to speak the language. And this peninsula used to be Arabic, the language they had to command apart from, from Spanish, in order to rescue the, uh, the captives. And they, they took money, they were entrusted by the authorities. Wait a minute, who was capturing who? Uh, the Christians were captured by the So Muslims. this is an Arabic interpreter? Arabic interpreter. Who was? Well, uh, it was sometimes a Christian mm -hmm. who knew Arabic because there were a lot of people who lived in, uh, in, in cross-border mm -hmm. situations. Either I mean, borders were very flimsy in those days. They changed yeah. a lot. So they may uh, or they might have grown up in, in Arabic-speaking um, uh, zone in Arabic speaking zone or playing mm -hmm. with the kids who spoke Arabic and they knew Arabic. They, they still were Christians and they were entrusted by the authorities to go and, and rescue them. So that is the name that inspired or that is the figure that inspired the name of our group mm -hmm. which is also to, I mean it's intended also to work in the field of um, uh, language mediation yes. and uh, basically to, to rescue from captivity of ignorance, uh, those people who do not know the languages or cultures, that is the idea. But it is mainly um, an, an issue that has to do with the, um, with, with the combination of, of a space and, and, and time. I mean, we go back mm -hmm. in history. Well, we know you though as the historian mm -hmm. of conflict to is that a fair description, do you think? Well, I, I've, I've uh, studied the, the, the history of, of the beginnings of, of conference interpreting, mm -hmm. which uh, happened, in my view, uh, I, I, I always give the, the, the particular conference, mm -hmm. the 1919 conference in, in Paris, mm -hmm. after the war, when interpreting was needed in order to, to make it possible for the um, uh, presidents and the, the big four to communicate uh, among themselves. Lloyd George did not speak, he was very bad at French. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently he spoke Welsh though. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, President Wilson knew no French. Clemenceau knew both languages. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Orlando, the Italian uh, president spoke only French and Italian, so mm -hmm. they needed mediation. Between so this is at Versailles, the Versailles conference right. after That's the right. World War. That's right. That was consecutive interpreting. That was consecutive right. interpreting, and it was consecutive all, all along the uh, League of Nations time, except for certain conferences that took place from the mid 20s. They started in the mid 20s mostly in the ILO, in the International Labour mm -hmm. Organization, uh, where simultaneous was used. Oh, really? Simultaneous was used in, in 1927 already, and the first course of simultaneous interpreting uh, was organized by the ILO in 1928. So it's not the famous Euroberg no. trials that we hear about? No, no, I mean, they, of course, uh, the um, great spotlight Mm. On, on simultaneous interpreting was uh, achieved thanks to, mm -hmm. to, to Nuremberg, but uh, it has started, it has started several years ago, okay. as several years before. I mean, several as, as many as almost twenty years before, actually. Okay, you've got into this as a practicing interpreter. Yes. First, and then an academic. Yes. 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 In fact, I, I arrived in the profession of interpreting rather late, and by. You know, Happenstance, I would say. Let's go back. Well, where were you when you were 24, 25? 
So when I was 24, 25, I was teaching uh, history in, in, in Salamanca, in the secondary school in Salamanca. Mm -hmm. And I was um, uh, also teaching something that could be called like geopolitics. It was geographic, uh, ge geography, well, it was called descriptive geography, but it was geography of, of, the, of the main countries and uh, it was more, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the approach that I took was of geopolitics and that was in, in the Department of Geography at the University of Salamanca, where I was in those days preparing a PhD dissertation that I never on, on geography on urban geography. So how do you get there to interpret it? <laughs> well, I went as a, as a teacher uh, of history and geography in the, in the um, Spanish school in London, um, the Spanish secondary school in London. They, they have different branches mm -hmm. in different countries. And uh, from there, I, I applied for a post that I saw in the um, ad in, in the newspaper uh, for the UN as, as a translator. Then I, in New York? In New York. So from London I jumped into New York. So you're, you're a secondary school teacher in London? Correct. And you go to New York to be an interpreter? Uh, well, first, not as an interpreter, but as, a, as what is called verbatim reporter. Okay. Uh, which was a... In, in fact, it was mostly translation work. Translation work from, from English and French into Spanish. The, uh, the verbatim records mm -hmm. of the Security Council right. and the General Assembly. I mean, the... Uh, different um, bodies that are entitled to, to have verbatim records, we, we did that. Okay. And after two years or so uh, doing that, I uh, sat for the interpreter's exam. Uh, I was self-trained. I mean, right. I trained. So you became a United Nations interpreter yes. with no formal training indeed, in interpreting. Indeed, or in translation for that matter. But none really existed. Or was there formal training available? Well, formal training existed in, in, the, uh, in this uh, university institutes in, in Spain, mm -hmm. the three famous ones of, the, uh, of Las Palmas in the Canary mm -hmm. Barcelona and Granada. Yes, Those were yes, the yes, three yes. pioneering yes, you know, right. uh, okay. But you didn't need that? No, I, okay. it's not that I needed it or not. I mean, it is a matter of... of of uh, having prepared myself, of course, with the supervision of some um, veterans in, 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 the, in the trade and mm -hmm. who saw me, listened to me, corrected me, and, uh, and then they, they co-opted me after the exams okay. as, 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 a, as, a, as a staff interpreter. How in the, um, long were you there? Ten years in New York. Ten, ten, okay. ten years then, in, in the UN. And then I, I was hired by the University of Salamanca to take care of the interpreting section. Now, why would anybody go from a very high paid job in New York to a moderately paid job as an academic in Spain? Straight jackets exist. <laughs> <laughs> so. But you would have lost money shortly doing that. Yeah, but I, I, never, I never made any or based any of my decisions uh, on, on uh, I would say, pecuniary uh, yeah. considerations. Yeah, I was, I went when I went from, from London to New York. I, I was also losing money. Really? I was earning more money in London. Than I but you would have gone up in the UN hierarchy, yeah. sure. Well, uh, eventually yes, but okay. <laughs> uh, well, at the beginning it was it was not a it was not a good really a good deal from from the point of view. Of, uh, of, of accounts. <laughs> so, I'm interested now in, in the role of research with relation to interpreting practice. You, you said you're, you're, you have a research group, mm -hmm. you're a member of a research group. Mm -hmm. What kind of research do you think we have to do that could be of use to interpreters? If any. Well, um, I, I know this is not necessarily politically correct, but I, I'm not sure of how much the um, research that is produced in universities in the field of interpreting or translation studies in general is read by uh, practicing interpreters. Oh, no. Uh, no. What I mean is I, I am not sure what the uh, effect of our research can be 
regarding the improvement of, of the profession. I think it is good, always it is good to, to reflect on, on, on the profession because what you can achieve is probably to accelerate a little bit, a little more, the, the, the process of, of, of learning, the learning process of the profession. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the more you research in the field, the more you, you know how to convey the uh, gist of, 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 uh, of the interpreting competences and skills, the better you're going to probably to put it into practice with your students. The, the, the connection would be research training profession. Yes, well, it, I mean, you, you asked me what the repercussions were yeah, yeah. on the profession, and, and the only repercussion that I can see is that one, not yeah. necessarily, I mean, if, if we if we research in, in many of the fields where we see a lot of even PhDs uh, performed, um, that wouldn't have any significant role in the improvement of the profession. It is not directly. Directly, directly. I mean, it is mostly something that goes uh, along the academic track. I mean, yes. you need that for whatever to for, become a for teacher. promotion for tenure for whatever, but not necessarily for, for the profession. What is this? Separate Are there any sort of topics that you would recommend? Uh, students work on as, as research students. Is there anything we should well, be doing? Any, anything that um, that helps them understand what is involved in the process of uh, of, of exchanging between languages and, and cultures. That is mainly the, the thing. I mean, if you mm, yeah. if you reflect on that, you will be in a better position to know how you should approach your preparation in order to become a better, a better professional. Let, let me give you an example. I mean, all, the, all, all this um, movement uh, of uh, community interpreting, uh, public service interpreting that has taken place in uh, many Anglo-Saxon countries uh, particularly and all the movement of the critical link and, yes. so, and so forth. This is, um, an excellent initiative, of course, but this is something that existed uh, a long time yes. ago, before, and there is a clear disconnection be between what happened in the past and what is happening now, so that we are, in a way, starting again and, uh, I, I dare say, rediscovering the wheel uh, all the time. I'm not sure whether that is necessary if you have a good knowledge of what happened before, I mean, when services were established um, in, in, in Spain, for example, or in the, in the colonial times, uh, um, interpreting services existed in, in countries and in territories like uh, the Philippines, mm -hmm. Peru and Mexico uh, at the same time, mm -hmm. with a number of languages being used as, uh, as, as passive or active languages. In the, in the exchange, this was perfectly well regulated in the, in the regulations of the 16th century. And this existed before. Okay. We are reinventing. We forgot the about that. We forgot about that. So there is merit in, in, in learning things which can have an impact uh, in the uh, real life situation of, of, uh, of our present day uh, you know, uh, difficulties or, or problems. Jesus. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, sorry, we're doing this in a train station. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>